Oh, wind, a blowing all day long. Oh, wind, that sings so loud a song. Oh, you, that are so strong and cold. Oh, blower, are you young or old? Are you a beast of field and tree, or just a stronger child than me? O oh, wind, a blowing all day long. O oh, wind, that sings so loud a song. In 1998, Royal Birkdale delivered an open which became renowned for the adventures of those at an unlikely age. At just 17, Justin Rose had amazed the golfing world. And the champion, Marco Mira, became the oldest man to win two majors during the same year. Ten years later, Birkdale would again be the setting of one of the most astonishing stories in the Open's history, and one of the most compelling championships in the most demanding of conditions. The 2008 Open would be a classic. For the 137th championship, the R&A brought the Open back to England's west coast. Adjoining the Irish Sea, the town of Southport and the village of Birkdale are less than 20 miles north of Liverpool and south of the popular seaside resort of Blackpool. In the 19th century, Southport became established as a more sophisticated alternative to its neighbour and the town attracted wealthy entrepreneurs from both Liverpool and Manchester. These gentlemen found that the town was close to classic links land and they formed a number of clubs attached to outstanding golf courses. Of these, Royal Birkdale has become one of the most respected open venues. In 2008, an unusually wet spring meant the course was lush and the links would play to their full length. For the championship, a number of significant adjustments were made to the course. It's just a matter of toughening up the venues a little bit to give them a slightly different test. It's, it's not about length. We've only added 150 yards. It's 2%. Uh, you know, instead of hitting at 100 yards in 1998, now you have to hit at 102. That's not the big issue. But uh, the bunkering's been tightened in, more strategic bunkering from the tee, and just give the players a little bit more to think about. 156 players from 27 different countries teed off. In the year that the most populous nation on earth would host the Olympic Games, mainland China was represented at the Open for the first time. Liang Wangchong had qualified for the championship by winning the Asian Tour Order of Merit. In the field were 14 previous champions, seven US Open winners, eight players who'd won the Masters, and five who triumphed at the US PGA. But this year, golf's most famous face was missing. Tiger Woods finished just outside the playoff in 1998 and had since won the Claret Jug on three occasions. Sadly, injury prevented the world's preeminent player from competing in his 14th consecutive championship. It's obviously a shame that Tiger isn't here. He is the number one player, but I'm sure we'll crown a, a worthy champion. It's, uh... Birkdale is a very popular golf course with the players. Uh, it's very fair. What you see is what you get. It, it's demanding. Uh, it's a driver's golf course. You've got to be hitting the ball, I think, on the fairways here. And uh, I'm sure we'll get a great ball striker as champion. Adding charisma in Tiger's absence was 53-year-old Greg Norman, who arrived more in hope than expectation. Norman had recently married the outstanding tennis player Chris Evitt, and the couple added a little celebrity glamour to the week. Nobody could have predicted what a dark horse the white shark would be. 
Expectations this week, uh, not very high to tell you the truth. I haven't played a lot of golf, so when you're coming straight into a major championship, you better have all your cylinders firing, not just maybe a couple of them. The 2007 champion, Portrick Harrington, had prepared for his defence by winning the Irish PGA Championship, just as he had 12 months earlier. If somebody offered me uh, a good title defence, I wouldn't take it. I'd rather have my chance of, of winning the 2008 Open. Harrington's build-up also involved officially opening the 2008 Junior Open at nearby Hesketh Golf Club. He also presented each of the 108 competitors with their player's badge. Two days later, Harrington shocked the press by announcing that he may be forced to withdraw from the championship due to a wrist injury. Sadly, every year you get about five or six broken ankles, a couple of broken wrists. Uh, it's not uncommon to have two or three heart attacks each year. People still get hit by golf balls. The golfers aren't as accurate as they'd like to think. Just reach down and put your finger on that ball. Okay. 2003 was our busiest year, down at Sandwich at 811, which for five days of the effective championship is quite a lot. After consulting his own doctor, Harrington walked the course instead of practicing on Wednesday. He eventually made the decision to defend his title. On the eve of the championship, the weather conditions were ominous. The portents for a bright start in the morning were not good. The fears were confirmed at daybreak on Thursday, the 17th of July. Not only did the wind blow all day long, it was as cold and wet as winter. At 6.30, Craig Parry was the first man to set out into the wild. The conditions for the morning starters made low scoring impossible. Of those who teed off before lunch, only South Africa's Retief Goosen and the left-handed Canadian, Mike Weir, managed to prosper. Goosen nearly held out on the ninth with his six iron. And Weir's successful putt on the 17th earned him one of the only two eagles achieved on day one. Given the conditions, their one over par totals was stoical efforts. Elsewhere, some scarcely believable numbers were posted the 2002 champion Ernie Els was round in 80. So too was Vijay Singh, who described his round as miserable, miserable, miserable. They would not win this year's championship, nor would the world number two, Phil Mickelson. He suffered a triple bogey on the sixth after he lost his ball. I'm based here this week at the police pod behind me, um, in charge of other things, lost and found property. We've had numerous umbrellas, car keys, back, backpacks, lots of waterproofs and hats. Windy. <laughs> well, 500 pounds in cash was handed in, um, along with the, a bank card and a pin number with the bank card and a driving licence and a passport. More keys, another wallet, hat, waterproofs, and a mobile phone. And the list goes on. The players found that the weather had marginally improved after lunch and power became possible. One of the three men to return a 70 was Adam Scott. This was his birdie putt on the sixth.
Surprisingly, Greg Norman found himself on the leaderboard. Having admitted to playing more tennis than golf prior to the Open, he also returned a round of level par. Well, there's petrol in the tank. I'll be honest with you, uh, everybody says yeah, it's like riding a bike, but it's not really. And even when you get back on the bike, you're going to be a little bit wobbly. And completing the Australian challenge was Robert Allenby, one of only three men to get into red figures. Allenby shared the first round lead with Northern Ireland's Graham McDowell, who'd won the Scottish Open at Loch Lomond the previous weekend. And Rocco Mediate completed those to post a score of 69. The chip in at the penultimate hole was followed by another birdie at the 18th. So after a bruising opening day, only six players had managed par or better. There were eight players who shot 71, including the consistent American Jim Furyk and England's Simon Wakefield. At 1.40, Liang had become the first mainland Chinese player to hit a ball at the Open. Heaven knows what he made of the English summer and Birkdale's rough. But he was in good company. Even the world's top players struggled in the undergrowth. As for the defending champion, Harrington's four over par first round represented a solid start. I'm sure I, I would have taken it on the first tee. Uh, 74 will be a respectable enough score with 54 holes to go in this tournament. As night fell on the windswept links, the weathermen were predicting more of the same for the morning. Another dank day did nothing to deter the spectators. 44,500 golf fans passed through the turnstiles on day two. In total, over 201,000 people attended the championship. It was an extraordinary statistic given that Tiger Woods was missing and such inclement weather was present. On Friday, the spectators were treated to another intriguing day on the links. The Colombian Camilo Bijegas took part in the championship after being the first reserve. His progress went more or less unnoticed until he birdied holes 14, 15, 16, and 17. Don't go left. Don't go left. After his approach had rattled the 18th flagstick, he had a putt for a startling 65. Jagers hold for a fifth consecutive body, and he had completed the lowest round of the week. In the group behind, Greg Norman continued to confound. On the seventh tee, he punched a four iron to set up a body and followed it with another at the eighth. Norman demonstrated the wisdom of his age and, when in trouble, the brilliance of his youth. His up and down from a horrid lie in the sand at 16 was exemplary. Norman had reminded the world of why he was once the game's leading player and he received an ovation normally reserved for Sunday afternoon. A 20-footer from the back of the final green was the last of his 70 strokes. Well, yeah, of course you feel like you're stepping back in time. Uh, my expectations were almost nil coming in, to tell you the truth. I hadn't played a lot of golf. 
but the, the feeling is phenomenal. There's no question about it. Also jogging the memory was the sight of an English amateur holding out from the rough on the 18th. Chris Wood from Bristol replicated Justin Rose's infamous shot to finish with a round of level power. Podrick Harrington, meanwhile, had quietly gone about his business and gratefully picked up shots where he could. On the closing holes, he made a significant move. This was for an eagle on the 17th. Clearly, Harrington was not going to relinquish his title easily. At the final hole, he hit his 9-iron 183 yards downwind and holed out for a 68 and a two-over par total. The defending champion had put himself in contention with an incendiary finish. This week at the Open, I've been working as an explosive detection dog handler with my dog, Jasper. His role and his sole role is to detect explosives. We will be tasked throughout the day to search different areas, some of the um, parcels that are delivered to the course and make sure that uh, there's, no, uh, there's no dangers. It wouldn't be unusual to find a hot dog sausage or a, a pie. As the second day drew to an end, an Asian player seized the halfway lead. KJ Choi from South Korea had started with a 72. Just before seven o'clock on Friday evening, he holed a birdie putt to go top of the standings with a 67. After two turbulent rounds, Choi was the only player under par. Norman was second, Bajegas third. The first round leaders, Mediate, McDowell and Allenby, all dropped back. One of the shots of the day came from the putter of pre-championship favorite, Sergio Garcia, who held a huge putt on the fourth. Another fine effort came from Justin Rose at the par 3 12th. However, neither Rose nor Garcia would trouble the top of the leaderboard this year. When the cut came, some familiar faces departed. The man who'd beaten Rose in 1998, Marco Mira, would not triumph again. Another Birkdale champion, Tom Watson, missed out by just one shot. Other names inscribed on the claret jug to head home included Paul Laurie and John Daly, who was 29 over par for his two rounds. It had been two grueling but absorbing days of golf, and those who survived the cut would produce a gripping weekend. If it were possible, the weekend brought even stronger winds, now from the east. But they were also finally accompanied by some blue skies. Behind the 18th green, one of China's most famous and respected actors, Zhe Wen Wang, was enjoying the sunshine. At the invitation of the r and he'd been at Birkdale all week, presenting daily broadcasts back to China. A keen golfer himself, the film star awaited the finish of Liang, who'd survived the cut after tapping in for a 77. 
当然就是来参加这个英国公开赛的一个观摩啊，因为特别的是有我们中国的选手梁文冲先生，今天在这里参赛啊，我们很高兴。昨天两天下来，他能够成功获得晋级，今天来为他加油。Liang eventually finished on 19 over par and tied for 64th. They call Saturday moving day, and it was indeed all change. Vijaygas, McDowell, Mediate, and Allenby all suffered in winds which gusted at 40 miles per hour. None of these players would challenge again. The 2003 champion, Ben Curtis, clearly thought he was heading for problems at the third hole. His worries proved unfounded, however, as his nine-iron shot held its line and disappeared for the only eagle on the front nine all week. Curtis was one of only four players to achieve a level pass score in round three. Another was the Swede, Henrik Stenson. This putt for a three at the ninth put him out in 34. Simon Wakefield elevated himself into fourth spot with his round of 70. Three birdies coming home would result in the Englishman being one of the last men out on the final day. Also upwardly mobile in the gales were the members of match number 28. Ross Fisher from the home county shot a 71 and moved from tied 27th to tied 5th. And Fisher's American playing partner, Anthony Kim, making his open debut, matched his achievement on a day littered with double and treble bogeys. My job on the championship committee is to make sure the course uh, and the tented village area is presented in the best possible way. With the help of the RNA, we've recruited uh, 200 children who will go out around the course in the tented village area in groups of 10, 10 kids and a supervisor. They're doing four hours uh, shifts at a time. Uh, we start from seven in the morning and finish at seven at night. I think the main challenges are keeping these young kids motivated. You know, the weather's been pretty grim. Keeping their peckers up has been the, uh, the most difficult thing, but they've been great on the whole. Back on the pristine fairways, Podrick Harrington's short game continued to impress. Having come up short on the fifth, he chipped in for a birdie three. Followed by large, enthusiastic galleries, the Irishman then played an imperious tee shot with his five iron on the par three seventh to set up another birdie. Harrington holed out on the 18th for a 72 and examine the leaderboard. It would eventually reveal that he would be out in the last pairing on the final day. I'd love to tell you that I'll do everything the same as last year and play the same as I did last year. Uh, I will attempt to do all those things, but uh, I might necessarily be in that zone tomorrow, but maybe I don't have to be either. The strength of the wind was playing havoc. It was particularly severe around the turn. Ian Poulter's ball visibly oscillated on the 10th green. Some players were made to wait up to half an hour on the tee for rulings up ahead. Poulter bravely held out despite the distractions. He was round in 75, but that was a fine score today. However, there was only one man grabbing the golf headlines on Saturday the 19th of July. 
I mean, I'll be honest, I walked to the first team nervous today. I hadn't felt that way probably for 10 years, maybe, maybe even longer. Twenty-two years after he'd won his first Open Championship at Turnbury, Greg Norman put himself on the verge of the astounding. It was a serious proposition that a 53-year-old man could win the Open. Who needs a tiger when you have the shark, proclaimed one headline. By the time he reached the final green, he needed an up and down to lead the 137th Open Championship by two shots. His chip shaved the hole, and Norman was round in 72. I put it um, top three hardest rounds of golf I've ever played under the circumstances. Uh, it was just brutal today. Much to the delight of the media, Norman was again greeted by his wife as he left the green to sign for a score which left him on the verge of becoming the oldest Open champion in history. His new wife and old adversary, Nick Faldo, discussed an extraordinary day. You know, I have the lead now, um, so I want to go out there with the same mindset tomorrow, and it's going to be tough again tomorrow, so uh, I've got to go out there and play my game, and you know, I'll answer a lot of different questions tomorrow night uh, if I have to. What are you doing now? Just whatever she is, yeah. Yeah, don't change, right? And then and it's very higher. Oh, yeah, the little kicks her. Yeah. All right, see you later. Choi had a 75 to share second place with Harrington. After three rounds, any one of 20 players could still win the Open. But all eyes would be on the final match. The defending champion Harrington would accompany Norman. As dusk fell, Royal Birthday braced itself for what could be one of the sports stories of the decade. Waterproofs were not required by the time the leaders arrived on Sunday, although the wind remained stiff and the air chilly. One or two degrees difference in the temperature makes a huge amount of difference to what the people are eat. So if there's a slight chill, they'll drink coffee and have food. We do all of the catering here. I think the biggest and most popular is still the English fish and chips, of which we sell about 20,000 this week. We had a special lorry come over from Holland uh, with the chips, uh, which is about 22 tonnes. After lunch and without the entourage that normally congregates on the practice ground, Greg Norman warmed up alone with his caddy in front of a scoreboard which reminded him that he was on the brink of making history. At 2.15, Harrington arrived on the first tee. He shook hands with Norman and they embarked on the first act of the afternoon's drama. The tee shot on this opening hole is the toughest opening tee shot I've ever played in golf under these conditions. It's brutal. And you just make one little mistake and you could you know, find yourself starting off on a bad foot big time. Norman's tee shot found the fairway. Harrington's, the light rough. And so it began. The Australian was the first to falter. 
I don't know. His approach found the front right bunker. Harrington had also missed the green with his second shot. However, his chip was executed to perfection. First hole was a key moment, but I chipped it stone dead from about 35 yards. It was always nice to start with a par, got you off on the right footing. Norman escaped from the bunker, but couldn't stop his ball close to the flag. His par putt burnt the edge of the hole, and he'd made the poor start he'd feared. Of the early starters, David Howell was the first man to post a clubhouse target. He was round in the day's best 67, which included an eagle three at the 17th. Another Englishman, Paul Casey, matched Howell on 12 over par. This pitch into the hole at the 15th garnered two shots back from the course. And Ernie Ells made a fine recovery after his first day woes with a final round 69. He eventually recorded yet another top 10 finish at the Open. Greg Norman's nervous start continued at the second hole. With Harrington in for a par, the Australian was faced with a testing putt to avoid dropping another shot. The lead was now shared. Ahead, the amateur Chris Wood had reached the seventh. Playing with Ian Poulter, he hit an impressive tee shot into the par three. Elsewhere, Simon Wakefield made up for a dropped shot at the first with a straightforward birdie after this approach to the fifth. Chris Wood converted his opportunity to record a two at the seventh. He was one of only eight players to birdie this hole on the final day. But Norman's headaches continued and he'd missed the green again at the third. Harrington also sent his approach off target, and his bunker shot, although well directed, scuttled past the flag. <laughs> However, the putt was successful and Harrington had started with three par fours. When Norman subsequently missed his putt for par, Bordrick Harrington led the 2008 Open for the first time. In match number 37, the players were inspiring each other. England's Ian Poulter had dropped two shots by the time he reached the ninth, but played a tidy approach to the green. His playing partner, Wood, bettered it.
At 10 over par, Poulter had an outside chance, but needed to make a move. He had launched his challenge. Chris Wood followed him in. He was not only on course for the silver medal awarded to the leading amateur, he was just three shots off the lead. The crowd at the ninth were treated to a third birdie in quick succession when the following match arrived. Also moving in the right direction, was Henrik Stenson. Poulter's charge gathered momentum after he turned for home. His approach to the 11th would result in another birdie, taking him to eight over while the leaders were beginning to struggle. Having serenely negotiated the first six holes, Harrington began to falter. At the short seventh, he dragged his tee shot left and subsequently made his first bogey of the round. At the eighth, he missed a short putt and dropped another shot. And at the ninth, he was out of position from the tee and again failed to find the green in regulation. Harrington had relinquished three shots in as many holes. When Norman nudged in his par putt from outward 38, the Australian led again. Ahead, the consistent Jim Furyk was at the 18th. His first class up and down from the sand gave him a 71 and the clubhouse lead at 10 over par. As the leaders turned for home, Norman was just nine holes from victory. Poulter was now third, but dropped shots on 11, 12 and 13 had seen Chris Wood fall away. Ben Curtis hit a splendid approach to the second, but it went downhill from there. He came back in 39 and never threatened to win his second claret jug. England's Ross Fisher also faded. He stumbled home in 43 and finished tied for 39th. Anthony Kim remained in contention for much of the day but a 5-6, 5 finish saw him share seventh spot. The members of the penultimate group also disappeared from the leaderboard. Simon Wakefield ran up an eight coming home and carded a 79. As did his playing partner, KJ Choi, who bogeyed six of the first nine holes. None of these men would be open champion. The wind continued to sing its song as it had all week. On the 10th green, it was again causing problems, but Harrington sank a demanding putt to stop the rock. When Norman bogeyed, the lead was again tied at plus seven. Harrington's body language suggested that he'd steadied the ship. But ahead, Poulter was in full flight. Having missed out on a birdie at the straightforward 15, he hit his approach shot, pin high, into the 16th green. <laughs> Henry
Henrik Stenson was also going along nicely. His eagle putt at the 15th didn't drop, but a birdie to get within two shots of the lead would duly follow. Back at the 16th, Poulter studied his birdie putt. If he held it, he would share the lead. After careful consideration, the ball decided to drop. And Poulter had a red star next to his name. Back at the 13th, Harrington found the fairway with an iron, a strategy he'd used extensively throughout the afternoon. Following a bogey at the 12th, Greg Norman chose a more aggressive play. This time, he reminded us of his less glorious past. There were shades of his defeat at Royal Troon in 1989, as a fairway bunker swallowed his drive. Norman's challenge was finally diminishing. In contrast, from six shots back, Poulter had emerged as the man most likely to challenge Harrington. Cheered on wildly, he found the par 5-17th with his second shot. Two putts from there, and he'd lead the championship. Harrington needed a five iron from the 13th fairway to reach the 499-yard par four. His caddy advised him on his club selection wisely. Back on the 17th, Poulter's eagle attempt had come up 10 feet short. He needed to make the putt for a birdie and take sole possession of first place. Instead, he squandered a golden opportunity. Seconds later, Harrington had the chance to take the lead once again. Poulter's miss and Harrington's body were the defining moments of this Open. The birdie on 13, I think, uh, won it for me. I think I hit five iron into about 15 feet and hold the putt. That really settled it for me. I think I was, uh, I was good to go from there. As he walked up the final fairway, Poulter was left to rue his failure to pick up shots on the 15th and 17th, the two easiest holes on the course. He knew he'd missed a trick. Henrik Stenson did manage to hold his birdie putt on the 17th, but at eight over, he was too far back to win. Chris Wood, completed the week of his life with his 72. He would finish tied fifth, the best performance by an amateur since Justin Rose a decade earlier. Ian Poulter was faced with a lengthy putt for par. If he could make it, Harrington would at least have something to think about. Poulter signed for a seven over par aggregate. He would have to wait to find out if it would be good enough.
Meanwhile, Harrington had arrived at the 15th. When he found the putting surface with his second shot and two putted, his lead was doubled. The tournament was his to lose. Despite his chances fading, Norman provided the gallery with another moment of brilliance. <clears throat> it was a brave shot, but there would be no fairy tale ending. Henrik Stenson tapped in for a bogey on the last and a plus nine total. It would be good enough for a share of third place and the congratulations of his Swedish caddy, Fanny Sunnesson. Meanwhile, Poulter waited in hope behind the 18th green, but Harrington had safely negotiated the 16th and was about to deliver the knockout blow from the middle of the 17th fairway. It was the shot of the week. Any doubts about who was taking home the claret jug vanished when Harrington converted the eagle putt. It's one of the few times I think I've ever heard my caddy say good shot to me before the ball is finished. Once I'd hit that, I knew I'd won the open. Now four shots to the good, and with no Barry Byrne to trip him up this time, Harrington had a pressure-free stroll to victory up the final hole. His strike into the heart of the 18th green confirmed that he was the best on show at Birkdale in 2008. I've always said there's nothing better than walking down the 18th hole at an open with the fans full, but there is something better. Having a four-shot lead when you're walking down the 18th and being able to enjoy it and wave at the crowd, uh, that was very special. The reception was not just for the champion, but also for Norman, who had contributed so much excitement and romance to the championship. He'd slipped up on the back nine, but still finished tight third and had added a wonderful story to the week. People will remember the 2008 Open not just for the champion, but also for the man who came third. Harrington couldn't manage another 3-3 finish, but tapped in to join an elite group of players who had retained the claret jug. They say that majors are won on the back nine on the final day. Tellingly, the overnight challengers were all home in 39 or more. Harrington completed the back nine in a four under par 32. In the end, it was a four-shot victory, with Poulter taking second place on his own. Norman shared third with Henrik Stenson. Jim Furyk again posted an impressive finish. For the record, nine players shared seventh spot.
Chris Wood, the 20-year-old amateur, finished joint fifth. He took the silver medal, but of course, missed out on an impressive paycheck. And ladies and gentlemen, with a score of 283, the winner of the gold medal and the champion golfer of the year is Podrick Harrington. Harrington had won the war of attrition with the element and the spirited fight that Poulter and his fellow challengers had put up. Last year it was a big high winning, you know, it was the thrill of winning a major. Uh, it was kind of unbelievable. This year it's more satisfying. I was in the last group going out there. There was a certain amount of pressure on me and I performed. I really performed. The Birkdale Open had again produced a deserving winner. It had also written more improbable stories of youth and maturity.